It's a strange thought. For thousands of years, we were not the only humans on the planet. We shared it with other similar people. Our closest extinct relatives were the Neanderthals. We used to picture them as hunched, grunting cavemen. That picture is wrong. They were intelligent, they were resourceful, they buried their dead, made tools, and likely had some form of language. And they were here for a very long time, spread across Europe and Asia. Then our ancestors, Homo sapiens, showed up. We came out of Africa and started spreading across the world. And where we went, we met the locals. We met the Neanderthals. For a long time, scientists debated what happened next. Did we wipe them out? Did we outcompete them for food and territory? Or did something else happen? The answer, it turns out, is a bit of all of the above. But it also includes something more intimate. We didn't just live beside them, we had children with them. This isn't speculation anymore. It's written in our DNA. If your ancestors came from anywhere outside of sub-Saharan Africa, you have Neanderthal DNA in you. It's usually a small amount, around 1-2% to of your total genome. It's a genetic echo of encounters that happened tens of thousands of years ago. But that 1-2% to is just an average. The amount varies. It varies from person to person and, more broadly, between different populations. This leads to a simple question with a complicated answer who has the most Neanderthal DNA today. The short answer, the one you'll see in most headlines, is people of East Asian descent. Studies consistently show that individuals from China, Japan, Korea, and surrounding regions carry, on average, more Neanderthal DNA than people of European descent. The difference isn't huge. Europeans might average around 1.5 to 2.1% Neanderthal ancestry. East Asians often average a bit higher, somewhere in the range of 23 to 2.6%. It might sound like a tiny difference, a fraction of a percent, but in genetics, that's a significant signal. It tells a story, and figuring out that story has been one of the great puzzles of modern human genetics. To understand why this difference exists, we have to go back to the beginning of the story. The story of us leaving Africa, modern humans evolved in Africa. For hundreds of thousands of years, that was our home. The Neanderthals, on the other hand, had evolved outside of Africa in the colder climates of Europe and Asia. For a very long time, our populations were separate. This is the key. The Neanderthal genome developed in Eurasia. The Homo sapiens genome developed in Africa, sometime around 60,000 to 80,000 years ago, a relatively small group of modern humans migrated out of Africa. This wasn't the first time humans had left, but this was the big one. This was the wave of migration that would eventually populate the rest of the world. As these humans moved into the Middle East, they walked into Neanderthal territory. And this is where the first, and perhaps most significant, mixing event happened. Here, in the ancient Near East, modern humans and Neanderthals met and interbred. Uh, the children of these unions and their descendants carried both human and Neanderthal DNA. This mixed population then became the source for almost everyone outside of Africa. From this point in the Middle East, they spread. Some went west, into Europe. Others went east, across Asia. Everyone who went on these journeys carried that initial dose of Neanderthal DNA with them. This explains the basic split. People whose ancestors remained in sub-Saharan Africa never encountered Neanderthals, so for a long time it was believed they had zero Neanderthal DNA. Some people whose ancestors left Africa all have some, but it doesn't explain why East Asians have more than Europeans. If everyone came from the same mixed population in the Middle East, shouldn't we all have about the same amount? This is where the real detective work begins. Scientists have proposed a few main theories to explain this. For a while, the leading idea was something called the dilution hypothesis. The theory went like this. After the initial mixing event in the Middle East, one group of humans moved into Europe. They were the first wave. Later, another wave of humans came out of Africa. This second group had no Neanderthal DNA because they hadn't mixed yet. They moved into the Near East in Europe and mixed with the first wave of human settlers who were already there. This second wave effectively diluted the Neanderthal ancestry in the European gene pool. Imagine you have a cup of dark coffee, the first wave with Neanderthal DNA. If you pour some milk into it, the second wave with no Neanderthal DNA, the coffee gets lighter. The overall concentration of coffee goes down. In this scenario, the ancestors of East Asians didn't experience the same dilution. They had already moved far to the east, so they weren't affected by this later wave of migration from Africa or the Near East. Their coffee stayed dark. This theory was plausible. It fit with what we know about ancient migrations, especially the spread of agriculture from the Near East into Europe thousands of years later, which involved large movements of people. 
But as we got better at sequencing ancient and modern genomes, a different picture began to emerge. This new idea is called the multiple pulse hypothesis. It's simpler, and right now it has more evidence supporting it. The idea is that modern humans didn't just mix with Neanderthals once, they mixed with them multiple times in different places. Think about the geography. The group of humans who left the Middle East and headed east had a vast continent in front of them. The Neanderthals lived all across Asia from the mountains of Central Asia to Siberia. As our ancestors spread eastward over thousands of years and thousands of miles, they would have had many more opportunities to encounter different groups of Neanderthals. The theory suggests that the ancestors of modern East Asians had at least one more major mixing event after they had split off from the ancestors of Europeans. So, the story would look something like this. Everyone's ancestors who left Africa got an initial dose of Neanderthal DNA in the Middle East. Then, the population split. The group that went to Europe took that initial dose with them, and that was mostly it. The group that went to Asia also took that initial dose, but then, somewhere further east, they met and mixed with another different Neanderthal population. This second, pulse of gene flow, topped up their Neanderthal DNA, pushing their average a little higher than the Europeans. This makes a lot of sense. The Neanderthal range was enormous. It's unlikely that the Neanderthals in France were genetically identical to the ones in Siberia. By sampling different Neanderthal remains, scientists have confirmed they had their own population structure. So it's entirely possible that East Asian ancestors interbred with an Asian Neanderthal population that was genetically a bit different from the Neanderthal population that our European ancestors first met. The genetic signatures in modern East Asians seem to support this. Some of the Neanderthal gene variants found in East Asians are different from those found in Europeans. This also helps to explain another interesting piece of the puzzle Native Americans. The first people to populate the Americas came from East Asia, crossing the Bering Land Bridge when sea levels were lower. Genetically, they are a branch of the East Asian family tree, and, as you might expect, they also have high levels of Neanderthal DNA, often on par with or even slightly higher than modern East Asians. They carry that genetic legacy with them across a new continent. So, the current consensus points towards East Asians, and by extension, Native Americans as the populations with the highest percentage of Neanderthal ancestry, likely because their ancestors had multiple encounters with Neanderthal groups as they spread across Asia. But the story doesn't stop there. The world is not just made up of Europeans, East Asians, and Africans. Um, the picture in South and Central Asia is much more complex. The Indian subcontinent, for example, has been a crossroads of human migration for tens of thousands of years. The genetic makeup of people there is a tapestry woven from multiple ancient groups. They have Neanderthal DNA, of course, but the amount can vary. It's often somewhere in between European and East Asian levels. This reflects their complex ancestry, which includes contributions from ancient hunter-gatherers, early farmers from the West, and steppy pastoralists from the North. Each of these groups brought their own genetic history and their own amount of Neanderthal DNA to the mix. And what about the people in Sub-Saharan Africa? For years, they were used as the baseline, the zero Neanderthal DNA control group in genetic studies. It was a core part of the out of Africa model they stayed, we left, and mixed. But science is always refining the story. More recent, more sensitive studies have found something surprising. Many modern African populations do have a small amount of Neanderthal DNA. Not as much as Eurasians, but it's there. How is this possible if their ancestors never left Africa to meet Neanderthals? The answer is back migration. History is not a one-way street. While the big story is about humans moving out of Africa, there have been many smaller movements of people back into Africa over the millennia. Eurasians carrying their Neanderthal DNA moved back into North and East Africa. They mixed with the local populations, and in doing so, they reintroduced a small fraction of the Neanderthal genome back into the African gene pool. So, the clean split we once imagined is a little messier, a little more human. There, there's another twist in the story of ancient interbreeding, and it, it involves another group of archaic humans, the Denisovans. We know even less about them than we do about Neanderthals. In 2010, scientists sequenced DNA from a tiny finger bone found in a cave in Siberia called Denisova Cave. The DNA didn't match modern humans, and it didn't match Neanderthals. It was something new. The Denisovans were a sister group to the Neanderthals. They split from the Neanderthal lineage hundreds of thousands of years ago and populated Asia. And just like with Neanderthals, when our ancestors spread into Asia, they met and interbred with Denisovans. 
While most populations around the world have zero or near zero Denisovan DNA, it is found in significant amounts in one specific region, Oceania. Uh, modern populations in Papua New Guinea, Australia, and the Philippines have the highest levels of Denisovan DNA in the world, up to 4 to 6%. This is on top of the Neanderthal DNA they already have. This discovery was revolutionary. It showed that our ancestors were not picky, they interbred with whatever archaic human populations they met on their journey across the globe. The story of human origins was not a simple branching tree. It was a web, a network of interconnected streams of genes flowing between different populations, both modern and archaic. For people of Melanesian descent, their genome is a remarkable testament to this complex past containing genetic legacies from modern humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. So we've answered the who and the who why, but what does it all mean? What does it actually do to have a small percentage of your DNA come from a Neanderthal? Is it just a historical curiosity or does it have a real impact on our lives today? It has a huge impact. Those little bits of archaic DNA weren't just carried along for the ride. Many of them were useful. When modern humans left Africa, they entered new environments with new challenges. Um, they faced different climates, different diets, and most importantly, different diseases. The Neanderthals had been living in Eurasia for hundreds of thousands of years. They were well adapted to these conditions. By interbreeding with them, modern humans got a shortcut. They picked up useful Neanderthal genes that had already been tested by evolution. Um, one of the most important areas where Neanderthal DNA helped is our immune system. Many of the Neanderthal genes that are common in modern humans today are related to immunity. They affect things called toll, like receptors, which are proteins on the surface of our cells that detect pathogens like bacteria and viruses. By acquiring these Neanderthal gene variants, our ancestors were better equipped to fight off the local diseases they encountered in Europe and Asia. It was a crucial survival advantage. Neanderthal DNA also affects our skin and hair. Several genes inherited from Neanderthals are related to keratin, a protein that makes up our skin, hair, and nails. These genes might have helped modern humans adapt to the different levels of sunlight and colder, drier air outside of Africa. Some variants are associated with thicker hair, tougher skin, and even hair and skin color. For example, some Neanderthal genes are linked to a higher risk of sunburn, but also a better ability to tan. This suggests they played a role in adapting our skin to the varying levels of UV radiation at different latitudes. But not all of the inherited DNA was beneficial. Some of it is linked to problems today. The world we live in is very different from the world of the Stone Age. A gene that was helpful then might be harmful now. Uh, for example, some Neanderthal gene variants are associated with an increased risk for certain modern health issues. One such variant increases blood clotting. In a world of dangerous hunts and frequent injuries, a faster clotting ability could be a lifesaver, preventing you from bleeding to death from a small cut. But in our modern world where we live longer and have different lifestyles, that same gene variant increases the risk of dangerous blood clots, leading to strokes and pulmonary embolisms. Other Neanderthal genes have been linked to a whole host of conditions. They can affect your risk for type 2 diabetes, Crohn's disease, lupus, and even depression. Some variants influence our sleep patterns, making some people more of a night owl. And in a very recent and stark example, scientists discovered that a major genetic risk factor for severe COVID-19 is a chunk of DNA inherited from Neanderthals. People who carry this particular Neanderthal gene segment are significantly more likely to become critically ill if they catch the virus. It's a powerful reminder that our deep past is still very much with us, influencing our health and well-being in ways we are only just beginning to understand. It's also extremely important to be clear about what this does not mean. Having more or less Neanderthal DNA does not make any population superior or inferior. These are tiny fractions of our genome that reflect ancient migration patterns, not modern concepts of race or identity. The differences in Neanderthal ancestry are a result of geography and history. They are part A of the beautiful complex story of how our species populated the planet, adapting and mixing along the way. Using this science to create hierarchies or divisions is a gross misuse of the data. The data itself tells a story of connection, not of difference. It shows that we are all, in some way, a mix. The very idea of a pure human lineage is a fiction. The ability to even have this conversation is a modern miracle. The science of ancient DNA is incredibly difficult. DNA degrades over time. Uh, it breaks down into tiny pieces. Old bones are often heavily contaminated with DNA from bacteria, fungi, and even the scientists handling them. For decades, the idea of sequencing a full Neanderthal genome was considered science fiction. 
The person who made it possible is Svante Pabo, a Swedish geneticist who dedicated his life to this problem. He and his team developed revolutionary techniques to extract and piece together ancient DNA. They worked in ultra-clean labs, drilling into ancient bones to get to the uncontaminated powder inside. They used powerful computers to assemble the tiny, shattered fragments of the Neanderthal genetic code. In 2010, they published the first draft of the Neanderthal genome. It was a landmark achievement that opened up a whole new window into our past. For this work, Pabo was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2022. His work allowed us to compare the Neanderthal genome to the genomes of people living today. By looking at a person's DNA and comparing it to the African baseline and the Neanderthal reference genome, scientists can identify the specific segments that are almost certainly of Neanderthal origin. They are chunks of DNA that are common in non-Africans, absent in the oldest African lineages, and match the Neanderthal sequence. By doing this for thousands of people from all over the world, they have been able to map out the legacy of our ancient cousins. So, in the end, the question of who has the most Neanderthal DNA leads us down a fascinating path. It starts with a simple ranking East Asians, then Native Americans, then Europeans, and other Eurasians. But it quickly becomes a much richer story. It's a story about migration, about how a small band of our ancestors left their African homeland and peopled the entire globe. It's a story about encounters in the unforgiving landscapes of Ice Age Eurasia, where our ancestors met other kinds of humans. And it's a story of mixing. Our species did not conquer the world by remaining aloof and separate. We survived and we thrived by being adaptable. Part of that adaptation, it turns out, came from mixing with the very people we were replacing. We carry their legacy within ourselves. Their genes help us fight disease. They influence the color of our hair and the texture of our skin. And sometimes, they make us more vulnerable to the challenges of the modern world. The fact that we have this DNA at all blurs the line between us and them. Neanderthals are not some failed, dead-end branch of the family tree. They are part of our story. Their blood, in a very literal sense, flows in our veins. They are ancestors and understanding their contribution to our genetic makeup is essential to understanding what it means to be human. The story is not over. As we sequence more ancient genomes and the DNA of more modern people, the picture will become even clearer, the story even more detailed. But the core truth will remain we are all the product of a complex and interconnected past, and we are not, and have never been, alone.